the trees are specific and the kind of soils that they flourish in the best are species specific. But there are general rules for having kind of a healthy soil and part of that is that you want to have a soil that's deep enough for the tree that you're growing. Um, you want to have one that has an, a water holding capacity or you could kind of think of it as the amount of water in a bank that's available to a tree. You don't want a tree consuming water at a rate where it's constantly bankrupt. You want to have enough available water for that tree to carry it for a while. Um, generally when we water, you want to do that then by watering um, maybe infrequently but deeper. And you want to be able to get that water through, infiltrate into the soil down to the deeper roots of the tree. And you want to consider that kind of like the drip line of a tree is probably the area that you want to really consider watering. Homeowners in Southern Nevada are faced with uh, a challenge in the type of soils that they acquire when they buy property. One of the most consistent things about soils are their inconsistency. And we have a large variety throughout the valley. So from being fortunate, maybe getting nice, deep, loamy soils, which is an ideal situation, probably is a rare condition in the valley. We have a lot of soil horizons that are cemented and sometimes they're cemented to the point of where they're just about literally concrete and they stop roots and they stop water. We have the ecology of our tree being from the top down to that layer and it stops there. There isn't no more past that. So if it's very, very shallow, then that presents a problem for several reasons, which we'll get into in just a second. Others are there's constituents in the soil in the valley that are chemically not very friendly. So we have soils that have a lot of salt in them too. And one of the things that's really problematic with salt is just simply this high salt content in the soil and it makes it very, very difficult for the roots to pull in water against an osmotic gradient from the salt. So only certain adapted plants called halophytes have this, the ability to do that. And if you are unaware of that salt being there and you plant a tree, odds are it will fail. It isn't going to do very well. There are things we can do to amend that, to change that. And all of that involves more money, more water, and preparation of the material that you're going to plant in. So it takes a little bit more effort to do that. And we talk about a texture of a soil and generally what you'll have is you'll get oh, a sand content, a silt content, and a clay content. And so we have those three numbers usually displayed in a triangle for their percentages and then we end up with a loam or a clay loam or a clay or a sandy loam. And that's a percentage of mixture of those. Sand is ginormous as far as the size of the soil particle. And I guess my analogy would be kind of a, a, a riprap you might lay along an ocean front that you want to protect from erosion. And so they'll bring in truck sized boulders and they lay this riprap along the, along the shoreline. Well, those boulders have interstitches and spaces in between them. You could go and play in them like caves. That's the sand grains. So they provide structure, but they have a very low surface area. And in general, they are formed from the most resistant minerals. So they're made of quartz and feldspars that are not really reactive very much. So there is not much in the way of fertility from the sand. It's just providing structure. Silt size can be a little bit more varied in mineralogy, but it can be all over the place. It can be, it depends. But the trick with silt is the size of it. So now silt size particles are like exactly the right porridge to hold water. This is the size that has the most impact on capillarity and water holding capability in a soil. And so the amount of silt that you have really is a good indication you can predict about how much water that soil is going to be able to withhold and hold that. Clays, they hold water too. They have really, really tiny pores, but clays are a special category. Clays are so tiny, we call them colloidal and they actually have chemical properties. They have a negative charge. And the negative charge on the clays 
attract positively charged cations. We're thankful for this because this is in fact then the fertility of soils. So they will have really tiny pore spaces and they will hold water so tight that it becomes hard for the plant to, with, to withdraw that water from those pore spaces. And so you can actually have a clay that will feel somewhat moist, but it will be physiologically dry to the plant. It won't be able to release that water. But the fertility of the clay is, is the big bonus. Here it is where we're gonna, we're gonna hold on to potassium, we're gonna hold on to ammonium, we're gonna hold on to calcium. That's just what's gonna be attracted and held onto clay particles and then released into an equilibrium into a solution and that's what's going to feed the plants. The plant roots are going to be able then to withdraw that out of solution. The three textures, the, the three particle sizes we have in the textures are what determine the benefits of the soil that you have. So if you have a soil that's way too sandy, doesn't have, does, it drains really quick, doesn't hold much water, doesn't have much opportunity for fertility, then you want to add more organic matter, add other materials to it to try to make it be not quite so sandy. If you have a soil that's really clayey, so clayey that you can't even get water to move through it, then you want to modify that as best you can to make it be, push it more toward more loamy. You can do that through adding organic matter and, and other textures, so you kind of want to mediate then that real heavy texture. One of the, the things that happens is that people will do this on a topsoil basis. So I'm going to go and I'm going to fix my topsoil and I'm going to add all this material to kind of make it better. But how deep am I going? So that becomes kind of the question. If I come in and I lay in a really rich, nice material, I might even buy it and have it imported and brought in. And I lay it right on top, but I don't do anything else. Now I have a very sharp contrast between those two materials. And again, we're going to probably end up with problems with water and infiltration movement in that. So the other trick then is to make sure and blend those things together. To, to dig into the soil and then as the material you bring back in to mix it in. And then if you end up then with that pretty much as what is your topsoil, you have a nice gradual boundary for that to drain and, to, and for that to happen. A long time ago, I remember thinking, well, that a, a tree, you know, is like an hourglass. It's an inverse. And in some way, the amount of evaporation that a tree will do through the leaves has to be matched by the amount of water brought up by the roots. But it doesn't, ma doesn't mean that we exactly have a mirror image of the roots from the tree, because that's not usually what trees will do. They'll go laterally. So I guess you could kind of say it's kind of like a mirror image growing on a plate. And so the percent of roots at the top, in the top foot or two of the tree, are very dense and very high. The relationship of the pH to the ability of the soil to provide nutrition. Um, Really low or really high pHs on either end of the, of the scale are problematic as far as nutrients being available. This doesn't mean that the nutrients aren't there. This means that the pH modifies the availability, the ionic availability of those nutrients as an ability to be adsorbed by the roots. Maybe an example would be best. If we talk about iron deficiencies in Las Vegas Valley, they're pretty common. And they're pretty common because our pHs generally are around eight and above. And when we get that high of a pH, <clears throat> the availability of the iron to the trees or plants that you have becomes very limited. But it doesn't mean that the iron is gone. It's all still there, tons of it, just doesn't, it's not available. You could go to stores and buy fancy cleated iron and products and add them in. Those do kind of a time release of the iron out of this cleate. And then the instant that iron's free from the cleate and it shows up in the soil, he's right next to all the other irons that aren't available either. So that doesn't really help as much. What we need to do is we need to drop the pH. And so it's much more inexpensive to buy elemental sulfur 
spread it around the tree line, drip line of the tree, water that in, that will turn into hydrosulfic acid and will change the pH, drop the pH. And then all of a sudden, once we drop the pH, all the iron that's there is available. It depends on how much effort one wants to put into getting that tree. To hit the caliche within a foot and put a tree in that hole is a mistake. That tree will die. You can, you can, you know, and it depends on what this caliche is. Some people, you can go get uh, a tool and bang on it and see if you can fracture or crack it. And if you can break it, and if you can get through the caliche, that's a horizon that you can get through. Then you're down into the material below, and now you have an opportunity to get something planted in there that might do some good. But it all depends on where you are, and it depends on what the soil is and the caliche thickness. And so there may be some cases where the caliche is really shallow and it's really thick. And there are resources like soil surveys that have been done in Las Vegas Valley. And you can take a look and see what the soil is where your house is. And that's going to give you insight into how thick this layer may be that's problematic. And it will help you make hopefully the better decision on whether you do or don't plant something in there uh, to spend the effort and the money to have it fail. And if it's below the root zone where that caliche occurs, the plants don't ever know it's there. So it doesn't really make a difference. Please join us on NevadaPlants.com and Nevada Plants YouTube for more information on how to plant trees and tree care. And keep on planting.